In three. Uh, everybody, come on. In three, three two, two, one. one. Action. and welcome to TF Blockchain. This is a Seattle chapter uh, 12th event we've done. Uh, so this will be our first year full of, of these conferences, these sessions. Uh, tonight we are going to dig into something that I've been interested in for a long time. Uh, my background uh, is in financial services, but before that I did radio and news way, 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 way back when. So I love just talking to people and getting to know a little bit about them. So combining the two to me is, is just gonna be fascinating tonight. So a recent article came out that uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, just made their 100 billionth dollar or Bitcoin investment. And it was phenomenal to just think of that. I thought, 100 billion dollars? Phenomenal. So I uh, uh, started doing some research and then ran into our two guests and got to know them pretty well. And I wanted to uh, get to know them and we'll do some Q&A about who they are and what they're working on. Our first guest is uh, Dan Iyer, uh, Dan, and then uh, Brock Conley. And uh, Dan is with a company called uh, uh, Blockchange.ai, and uh, Brock is with an, another startup, and, th and that's in San Francisco. That's right. And uh, Brock's company is in Bellevue, and it's uh, called uh, Block.Capital. Round Block. Round, round Block. Capital. Round, yep. round Block Capital. I'm sorry, Round Block Capital. Okay. So Dan, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story, what you're doing, and, and how you got into business. Sure, and thanks so much for having us today. Um, so, blockchain, uh, as you mentioned, is a, a platform for financial advisors to invest in digital assets, the broader category. Uh, I didn't start, actually, in the world of finance. I started uh, in industry back in the day, in, in the materials business and wound up in supply chain. And uh, that career path kind of took me uh, to an interesting company that recently went public called Anaplan. Uh, we have some folks here today that uh, also uh, are related to Anaplan, but basically it was financial planning and analysis tools. <coughs> and so I was a software guy uh, at that point. I spent a number of years there. Uh, first building out the supply chain line of business, and then after that, uh, focused on the AI line of business or machine learning. And so it was kind of curious for me at the time, my college roommate uh, and I were playing around with mining cryptocurrencies and we designed some algorithms to figure out which ones were gonna be the most profitable. And we were having a good time doing it and just decided, well, let's see what we can make of this. So we started a business together and almost immediately, we realized that mining was not gonna be viable for us because it, you really, really need very, very broad scale to be able to, to run a full business in mining. Uh, but the algorithms that we had developed uh, were useful for figuring out how to route trades to multiple exchanges. And so we built a retail product around that that was um, you know, interesting uh, for you know, its time. Uh, I think it was a little bit more sophisticated than a lot of investors were ready for. And when we introduced that in uh, 2018, 2019, uh, you know, the market wasn't quite ready. But uh, in parallel, we've been working on this RIA strategy. Uh, and basically, we, we went and we did a whole bunch of research <coughs> with a, over 250 different RIAs. And we found that there was a, a, a very large need there. It was an untapped market, total white space. So. We've just been scaling our team around building out that, that RIA uh, line of business. And just uh, clarify what RIA is. Sorry. Yeah. RIA is Registered Investment Advisor. So um, it, we can do business <coughs> with both registered investment advisors and broker dealers uh, and those that are duly registered. So that's kind of the, the genesis of okay. our, our team and our project. We'll go a little deeper on that in a little bit. Brock, tell us your story. Yeah, and Jonathan says talk loudly, but I'm kind of a loud talker anyway, so that hopefully it shouldn't be a problem. Um, so yeah, Brock Conley, CEO of uh, Brown Block Capital. So we are an NFA registered, CFTC regulated 
um, uh, futures, options, and derivatives broker. So um, specifically focused on digital asset futures. So right now that's just Bitcoin futures and options that are traded on CME backed. And um, there's another exchange actually out of Chicago that has their DCO DCM uh, license uh, called Irisex that's actually going live very soon. And I'll be able to introduce my customers to those contracts. So. Um, yeah, in terms of a little bit about me, my background, so I'm a trader. Um, I essentially grew up on the trading floors in Chicago, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh, Chicago Board of Trade. Um, so uh, yeah, my father was a member of the exchange, my brother was a member, um, I'm a member of CME, I own a seat on the exchange, I'm one of 625 individuals or institutions that own a seat on the exchange. And so I come from really, from really traditional futures derivatives um, type background. And um, so working on the trading floor as what we call the local, but it was essentially a market maker when there was actually still trading done on trading floors, um, um, you know, um, participated in a number of different complexes, equity derivatives, treasury derivatives, um, um, grains, uh, and actually eventually ended up in livestock. So I kind of cut my teeth learning trading and order flow in the uh, lean hogs pit of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is really kind of blows people's mind being out in Seattle. But of course, you know, all of that liquidity went eventually to uh, electronically. Um, now, you know, most of the trading is done uh, by machines. And so, um, you know, 2012 moved out to Seattle, kind of, out, kind of on a whim, and um, you know, just been trading um, different accounts for different customers, family offices, you know, essentially my own, my own accounts. During that time, um, volatility in traditional markets really came down, right after the financial crisis, as liquidity was pumped into the system, correlations kind of went to one. And so, as a trader. I needed, um, you know, different products to trade, so I wasn't actually introduced to um, digital assets, you know, via <laughs> technology background, but via trading background because here was a volatile asset that was great to trade, and a lot of people were asking about it. A lot of customers that I used to service, um, you know, on the exchange were asking about it. So kind of got involved um, in the markets that way, but you know, being on the West Coast, got involved in a lot of different um, projects. Um, you know, just going to meetups, in, investing in, in different projects, um, mining, learning about, you know, really how the chains work and the, and the technology behind it. Um, and uh, eventually, um, you know, talking to people, you know, on the exchange, board of directors about, you know, members are always able to kind of canvas um, exchanges to bring new derivatives products to market. And I was one of the guys kind of there saying to the CME, you guys should be looking really serious, you know, about this um, thing, Bitcoin. I know you think it's a little bit crazy, but you know, really, uh, you know, everything we've brought to the market over the last, you know, 120 years, it was always considered crazy at the time. Finally, they listed it, and I thought, here's a really interesting opportunity for me because coming from the traditional trading world, and now kind of having a toll, you know, a foot in the door with uh, native digital assets. I should start a firm and kind of bring these two worlds together um, in service, um, you know, uh, a, a wide variety of, of institutional and some and some individual customers basically get, gaining access to these derivatives markets. So talk a little bit. Let's go back in history to the, the Merck. So talk a little bit about that, and like what your your father, I think your grandfather as well, was in the space and why it was valuable to an investor. Um, well, futures markets in general, um, a lot of people, you know, have different misconceptions about why derivatives exist. And really, when you go back, you know, um, 120 years ago, futures contracts, um, you know, came to, well, I mean, technically speaking, you can go back to the, you know, mid 1200s with the first futures that were traded um, in Japan, and they were trading futures on rice, essentially. And they were, and interestingly enough, they were actually using rice as the underlying performance margin of those futures contracts, which is what a lot of futures contracts are doing now on the offshore exchanges, BitMEX, Deribit, what have you. You actually, I've gotten off tangent, but um, the, the point is futures markets exist for two reasons. One, to facilitate liquidity and price discovery of the actual asset itself. Um, it's more of a frictionless asset if you want to go out and invest in um, oil, it's a lot harder for you to buy a thousand barrels of oil than it is 
for you just to go to the exchange and buy one contract that represents a thousand barrels. So you bring um, you know, a number of different um, speculators in to speculate on where they think the price is going. And generally the, the uh, folks that are taking the other side of that trade are commercial participants. Commercial participants enter futures <coughs> markets to hedge their risk on the underlying product. So that's the two reasons that, that futures markets you know, exist and why they, why they came to fruition. Um, and it's, it's really the same reason that um, Bitcoin futures markets have you know, have you know finally uh, come to market, and have you know in a lot of ways have been successful. Whether you're talking about offshore derivatives exchanges or the onshore, um, you know, regulated exchanges, it's simply because uh, it's an easier instrument to gain um, access to directional exposure, and it gives you a means to um, hedge risk and manage risk in those markets. Got it, Dan. Talk about your product and who you're marketing to, who your target market is. Sure, so blockchain is unique in that we're targeting investment advisors. So that's an untapped market because they're kind of the last from a risk perspective to enter into a new type of investment. And in the world of digital assets, that's particularly true because it's technology that's only been around even since inception of Bitcoin for about 10 years now. Uh, so with that target market in mind, we need to continue to think about how we educate them uh, and making a case for, you know, I think Rob may have mentioned, you know, non-correlated assets. That's a big component of building out a diversified portfolio. Uh, there's also other aspects of, of showing that has lower downside volatility versus some other assets out there, gold being one of them. Uh, so there's a lot of, I don't know, sort of, well, there's some taboo in the industry with uh, the older guard of financial advisors that see this as sort of like, you know, it's monopoly money. Uh, and then there's the younger folks who are seeing this as a huge opportunity to uh, really deliver for their clients and see it as a big part of the future and the technology that's gonna be underlying all financial investments from now on. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a market that, as I mentioned, is very cautious, uh, but there's cautious optimism there and so uh, we're really trying to to reach them where they're at right now which is you know just sort of dipping their toes in in these waters so we talked earlier about the addressable market can you lay out that ecosystem and, and kind of where you're targeting into then sure yeah so uh, in this market segment you've got about 37 trillion dollars in assets and change uh, that's being managed by these uh, you know these these uh, institutions whether they're broker dealers and RIA or, or just RIA. And of those, uh, or of that 37 and change trillion, uh, you can kind of lob off the top quite a bit. Uh, really all the, the larger firms are not ready yet. Uh, most of our conversations result in them saying, yeah, it's, it's gonna be five to 10 years before we're ready to do this. They wanna see smaller and medium sized firms, you know, participate and succeed first. Uh, so that windfall is coming, it's just coming on a longer horizon. But once you kind of uh, excise that portion, you wind up with uh, firms that are under 500 advisors. And those firms are uh, you know, small and medium sized, and uh, that constitutes about six and a half trillion dollars, which is still very sizable. Uh, it's a, a bit more fragmented, so you're looking at, at smaller account sizes, but uh, you know, they're, they're ready to take a little bit more of a risk. And uh, of the assets that they would put under management for digital assets, you know, uh, they're not gonna put their entire portfolio in it, but roughly two to 5% is pretty consistently what we hear as like a, a good number to invest in digital assets. And so uh, that constitutes about uh, 100 billion in market opportunity right now. Yeah. And uh, so that, that'll obviously grow over time, but that's, Currently, what we're looking. Now, I heard a, I heard a question asked that said, "Well, you could just go out and trade digital assets on your own. Why don't what, what, what's your value to the to the advisor?" Yeah, I mean, you can you can trade any assets on your own. Uh, the benefit for uh, a client of a, a financial advisor is that they really understand the underlying mechanics of the market, and in understanding that, they can apply it to new asset classes like 
you know, cryptocurrency or other uh, types of digital assets. They, they understand when they should be investing in things, when they shouldn't be. You know, if, if someone wants to go out and do all of the analysis to figure out how to build the proper portfolio with, you know, non-correlated assets, and then generally, like, what do the fundamentals look like for one versus another? That's great, but there's very few people out there that can do that. And so the, the benefit is that, you know, you're going to someone who's really going to bring not just common sense, but specialized uh, knowledge of, uh, of how to invest properly. And how many, so you, you are in the beta phase, now where is your product? Yeah, so we are in uh, the later stages of finalizing agreements with custodians. Uh, so we're a non-custodial product. We never touch any of the assets that are managed on the platform. Uh, that's, that's not us. We are uh, an intelligence layer, and we're a software company. Uh, but the custodians out there, um, you know, the Coinbase's, Gemini's, Kraken's, you know, Binance, Bittrex of the world, uh, they have uh, the capability to safely store uh, as custodians those assets, but they also are the, the liquidity providers. Uh, so it's kind of a one-stop shop, which is a little bit different than traditional assets. But uh, the benefit there is that we can partner with them uh, in basically offer this service uh, as, as kind of a, a package deal. And so we're just in the later stages of finalizing what that package deal looks like. Got it. Got it. And you've done a lot of uh, testing and feedback from brokers and, and institutions. Yeah. So we had about 50 hours of one-on-one -on -one interviews. Uh, it was spread between collecting a lot of voice of customer and figuring out what do you like about the tools that you use now? What are the, the aspects of the tools now that you would want to make adjustments to uh, and really build the product that they were saying they wanted? And, and we're talking about advisors primarily here, uh, a number of asset managers and uh, some firm leadership. But the feedback that we got in these interviews, we, we applied, we built it out, and then we went back to them and we said, is this what, what you were talking about? And uh, we got very, very good feedback. And uh, so at this point, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're looking to kind of broaden our horizons, so to speak. And I want to get into the kind of the next level of business for you in a second. But Brock, can you tell us about your market, where you're going after, kind of lay out the whole ecosystem and then build down from there where you're really narrow targeting in? Yeah, so in, in terms of like um, our target customer, <clears throat> um, mainly institutional, although we do have a number of, of individual customers and in fact have a what, what a lot of people would call retail level um, you know, participants on our platform and we offer them um, you know, really simple point and click um, experience just as if they were trading on, you know, uh, Binance or, or BitMEX or what have you. Ultimately, um, you know, our target customer would be crypto centric hedge funds, um, crypto, you know, digital asset centric VCs that need to, you know, hedge some of their holdings, proprietary trading groups that would like to do some kind of cross exchange arbitrage. Um, and then, of course, anybody on the commercial side, so miners that need to hedge risk for their block rewards or OTC desks that really have kind of tipped their book one way or another that need to come into the futures market to hedge their exposure. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, the only listed um, futures contracts onto our, our now our Bitcoin, right? Um, there should be, uh, CME has actually initiated an index for Ethereum, which is you know, kind of the first step if they were going to bring uh, a futures contract on Ethereum to market. Although, obviously, there needs, you know, in terms of Ethereum, you know, switching over to version two, proof of stake, what have you, probably need to get through some of that before you're actually going to list a product on it. But um, so, yeah, really, anybody that um, you need, you know, needs to, um, you know, take risk or mitigate risk, you know, on, a, on an institutional level or any individual traders. Really what it comes down to is, you know, I could service any level of, of customer, but um, for instance, like the CME contract is five, five Bitcoin. So, you know, let's say it's trading at, you know, 9,000 today. So the notional value of the contract is $45,000. Um, generally speaking, um, my margin requirement for a customer is, um, you know, right at exchange level. So 18, 19,000. So anybody that has you know, that wants directional exposure to the market and has kind of that level of capital to trade on, I would, you know, I would be able to service. Got it. You said you're getting a lot of contacts now from out of the U.S. too. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, and it makes total sense. It's just, just like anything else. So obviously, you know, native digital assets, hi, you know, highly, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, I'm sorry, world, you know, takes the, a lot of the price discovery and trading takes place on a, on a worldwide basis. And so really the, you know, the real, most exciting thing for me is every day coming in, um, talking to customers or potential customers, like, you know, 90% of them um, are not US based, right? Um, and you know, a lot of them are already trading on um, offshore derivatives exchanges, um, and they want you know more of a, a you know regulated infrastructure. Of course, if you're a fund that has a fiduciary responsibility to your investors, you can't just be you know putting your money on you know um, unregulated exchanges. Um, and so you know, you know. CME, um, you know, kind of already has those pipes in line for institutional type, you know, participants because likely they're, you know, they're 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 trading on, you know, in the equity markets or the the treasury markets, and so, um, you know, it's it's you know, a, a really easy um, sell for them. The pipes pipes already there. Got it. Okay. Two or three years ago, what were institutions saying, and and what are you hearing them say now when you talk? Daniel, let's start. Sure. Yeah. So, when we started building our platform, a lot of the feedback that we got was, "It's too early for this." Uh, and now the feedback that we're getting is, "You're right on time." So, I think there was this general hesitance before, uh, particularly in uh, you know with RIAs and, and broker dealers, that this was sort of a fly by night kind of deal. And over time, that shifted to, okay, I mean, there's still some, some aspects that need to be worked out, but it does represent an opportunity. Uh, and the movement amongst the largest institutions like Fidelity, you know, Fidelity now has Fidelity Digital Assets, and uh, Coinbase has a number of additional institutions, for example, uh, that they, they custody for. So there's, there is this general adoption uh, happening uh, it's it's gradual, but now it's kind of at the the point where uh, it's good that we didn't listen two years ago, two and a half years ago, and we kept building it because it's going to be necessary now. Yeah. So I mean, the question um, in the with with this asset class is always like when institutions, right? And I like to kind of break that um, into different buckets, right? So um, you obviously have. Um, you know, well, let's just you know talk about Bitcoin. So, in in terms of like the plumbing needed to service institutional customers, like I largely think that that's a solved problem, right? We have qualified custodians, we have uh, regulated money service businesses, money transmitters in all fifty states um, around the world. We have um, you know you know products that are trading on you know traditional exchanges like CME and, and backed futures. Um, we really have most of the infrastructure put in. So if, if those folks are going to come in and um, you know um, invest, strictly talking about Bitcoin, that the, really the only hurdle is kind of a psychological one. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an educational perspective. And the way I like to look at that is, if you look at the arc of investments over history, right? Um, let's go back um, like you know the late 1800s. If you were investing in anything then, it was generally um, you know corporate debt, um, you know, sovereign debt, right? Then you had this run up in equity trading, led up to the, you know, boom in the 1920s. You know, there was a lot of shenanigans going on. Um, the market crashed. A lot of the, you know, um, law and regulation was put in now. But then you, you know, so, but just go like, you know, decade by decade, right? In terms of, um, you know, investors coming into new asset classes. So you had, you know, Think about um, high yield corporate bonds, right? Mike Milliken in the 70s and 80s, like before no one would have thought of, you know, investing in junk bonds, like the product didn't even really exist. Venture capital, right, is slowly becoming an asset class now that all institutional investors are in, private equity. I mean, you can, you can give like, you know, a million different things. And generally speaking, the ones that, you know, kind of embrace the, those kind of investments and, um, you know, kind of participate in that, you know, non-correlated um, asset class or the ones that really, you know, 
will will be paid over over the long term. And so, um, I think we're at a point now where it's, uh, it's a brand new asset class, something that's natively digital that doesn't exist in the real world. Um, and then we start talking about you know all the other what you would consider altcoins that there's you know a lot of uncertainties if if they're um, securities or if they're not securities. Um, and then you take it kind of um, on a worldwide spectrum. Um, you know, I, I, so I think, um, you know, uh, basically there, you know, institutionally wise, there's not a lot of huge hurdles left other, you know, for, for, uh, you know, Bitcoin investors like this, the, this, but the space in general, there's, you know, still a lot to go in, in a ton of uncertainty, but basically just kind of, um, changing mindset on what an investment actually is. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about, um, the risk a little bit about that we brought up. So what, what are the, first of all, what are the, um, Brock, what are the uh, um, regulations that you have to clear to be in business? Yeah, so, um, yeah, on my side, um, the regulatory bodies, so there's, you know, kind of the security side, SEC, FINRA, what have you, on the futures, you know, commodities, derivatives, we deal with the CFTC um, and the NFA. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm registered and regulated um, with, with those bodies, and it's, it's, you know, kind of a different hurdle. The interesting thing is, is that, I mean, and again, from a, from a regulatory perspective, I mean, there's, you know, um, Bitcoin, you know, it's, it's pretty much, um, um, you know, known, like kind of who has jurisdiction over it. It's, it's looked at as a commodity, essentially, it's taxed like personal property, and there are, you know, ups, ups and downs to that. But, you know, uh, Bitcoin, you know, is many different things to many different people, depending on how you, depending on how you look at it. You know, to me, coming from, you know, traditional commodities, it's a commodity it has a you know really distinct supply <coughs> demand curve, um, and um, you know the, the 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 underlying you know value of it. You could you could take a lot of things from the actual base chain itself, um, and kind of um, price it in a certain way that you would price you know grains or oil or anything else. So um, you know to me it's a you know you know fills that role as a commodity. It's regulated kind of as a commodity. So. Um, you know, it fits really nicely into kind of that regulatory regime if you're trading futures contracts on it. And yeah, that's, that's really who I have to deal with is the CFTC and the NFA. Got it. And Dan, what about you? Yeah, so on the advisor side, depending on whether they're also broker dealers or not, um, you're either looking at state and SEC uh, or you're looking at FINRA and potentially SEC. Uh, so the, the vast majority of firms don't really have to deal with FINRA. They do have to deal with the SEC. And um, so, you know, for us being a software platform, it's not necessarily uh, for us to comply with certain regulation. I mean, there's there, there's going to be our, our fair share of uh, ensuring that uh, we don't turn an RIA into a custodian because they kind of want to avoid that at all costs um, with annual surprise exams and everything as a consequence. But uh, our the work that we do needs to be very thoughtful in how it's architected so that it's ideal for them to be compliant, but also offer this, this investment in, in digital assets at large. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about beyond cryptocurrency as well, because we do see that as a, an area that will continue to evolve over the next several years. Talk more about that. We talked earlier. I'd like you to explain that to the, to the group. Sure. Yeah. I mean, think about the process of a company going public today. If you want to IPO, it's much later in the life of the company. You're a much more mature company. And then you're going to pay an enormous sum of money to list on one of the, you know, one of the exchanges where we're talking about New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ in the United States. That is not conducive to private businesses, smaller and mid-sized businesses uh, growing to their full potential. <clears throat> tokenized infrastructure is a major disruptor to that and that's because what before you had all of this paperwork and process associated with selling some portion of equity in your company now you can whip up some representation of that in the form of a token and determine who owns that in in a matter of a day i mean there's obviously process government regulation that needs to occur and uh, you know, Hester Pierce, the crypto mom, uh, has been proposing, you know, just today, I think, actually, uh, that there be a, a grace period of three years 
after a, a, a blockchain project is launched before the token is evaluated uh, as to whether it's a security or not. But that, that's, this is all interesting because uh, securities themselves, even though today they're traded uh, on traded and cleared on traditional infrastructure, tomorrow uh, the efficiencies that we see with blockchain uh, are going to be applied to all of those same asset classes. And it's just going to be a matter of where are those assets listed. And I think there's, there's going to be a number of very large players in the space that evolve to adapt to that new uh, infrastructure, that new technology. And then there's going to be some that are left behind and, and some that, that rise up uh, as you know, new entrants. But I'll give you an example of, of a, a good, clear signal here. The likes of Coinbase and Gemini, they're both awaiting their securities brokerage license right now. They're not doing that because of you know, cryptocurrencies. Those are commodities. They don't need it. They're doing it because they realize that this tokenization <coughs> trend is accelerating. And so that's kind of where you know, we want to be on the, the forefront of that. And that's why we see it as you know, this isn't just a cryptocurrency thing. This is uh, the evolution of an ecosystem of kind of the new guard of finance. Yeah, yeah. How do you deal with the regulation? Do you guys have a lawyer that you're on your hotline, or what? Like, what's your day like when it comes to kind of updating and keeping abreast of what's happening? So uh, we do have a, an attorney on our team. We were we were graced with uh, you know knowing her beforehand and working with her in the past, and that's been tremendously helpful. Uh, we also have uh, securities, or rather. Uh, an attorney or a firm that works in the RIA space. So everything we do is uh, aligned with uh, ensuring that we're not turning an RIA or a firm into a custodian, uh, you know, the, the kind of architecting our platform around that. And, and to go a little bit deeper on that, you're saying that if they don't have the platform right, they could end up holding the assets and accidentally being a custodian. Right, yeah, so uh, an RIA, a non-custodial RIA, uh, they can't transfer money from bank account to say Coinbase or even a, even a platform like ours. They can't make that transfer. Uh, there are certain circumstances where they can get an agreement from the client for like a one-time type deal. It can't be overly broad uh, or else they're, they're gonna be subject to the same annual surprise exam and they'll, they'll be a custodian. But if there's any point in the process with our platform or otherwise, that they could wind up being, you know, uh, potentially exposing the client to some theft of, of their, their monies or their assets. That's when they become, you know, a custodian. There's various degrees of that. Uh, some of them don't come with like annual surprise exams and that kind of stuff, which is actually the least of your worries at that point. But, um, you know, it, it is watched very, very closely because of, you know, what we experienced with Bernie Madoff uh, some time ago now. And uh, so that's, you know, there, there's a lot of rules around how money can move mm -hmm. from uh, first party accounts, third party accounts. Uh, and, and those are the type of in, uh, intricacies that we need to be uh, in tune with. And Brock, on your side, how do you? Yeah, so we were actually the first um, introducing broker registered with the NFA that was specializing in, in Bitcoin derivatives. And so they didn't really know how to treat us. Even though the, co the, the contract was already live, it was out trading, there was really nobody providing specific advisory uh, and brokerage services on this product. And so they had kind of, this, both the CFTC and the NFA, if you go to our website, it's actually the, the first thing front and center, it's these two um, you know, customer um, you know, advisory links that I had to put front and center on my website that is essentially no other broker in the entire world has to put on it. Um, and I uh, have it on, you know, front and center on my Twitter feed and on, and on, my, on my LinkedIn page, um, et cetera. And so um, we were kind of um, breaking new ground. And, but you know, ultimately these are um, products traded on exchanges where they, they're trading you know, all, all the other futures and options contracts that are listed in the world. And so, you know, from uh, when you get down to, um, you know, the, the base of it, um, you know, especially CME, since it's just a cash settled product, like I, I'm taking, um, 
uh, you know, fiat as performance margin. And I'm not actually even touching that. Uh, my clearing partners, which are FCMs, are actually handling the money, clearing the trade, interfacing with um, the exchanges, um, DCO, DCM mechanisms. And so, um, you know, it's really kind of, um, you know, just on the outside that I've had to deal with a lot of regulation. I mean, it took me seven months to finally get my license um, going through the NFA process, but that's um, kind of t kind of typical. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I have, uh, you know, attorneys in Chicago that is essentially kind of had to open up a brand new playbook of how we, they would get a firm like mine um, registered and, and regulated. So, great, thank you for that. How do you, so from an individual investor point of view, should, a, should they think that um, institutions getting into the space is a positive thing, negative thing, neutral? How do you look at that? So, I mean, from, from my perspective, it's generally a positive thing. If you're talking about price action, uh, higher demand is gonna lead to higher prices, and I, I think that that's certainly proven true each step of the way. Uh, I think there's a lot of change that's probably coming as a result of that. Uh, so the landscape might look very different than it is today, and I think you know, generally people aren't very good with change. Uh, so I, I do think uh, there, there's potentially uh, going to be a little bit of a shakeup. There's a, a maniacal focus right now on know your customer and anti-money laundering. And I think that we've kind of just seen the beginning of it. Uh, there's a high likelihood, I think, that before the institutions, especially the large ones, come pouring in, it's gonna be a very, very you know, uh, detailed scouring of the, uh, the public ledgers as they are. Uh, and also, you know, there's gonna be a lot of effort around ensuring that there's not market manipulation, which is a huge, huge, hugely difficult thing uh, to identify. And I think that that's where some of the hesitancy still comes from in this space uh, is around the, the potential for market manipulation. But generally, uh, if you're ready to hang tight to your seat, uh, then it'll probably be better for everyone in the long run. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think institutional, you know, participation gives legitimacy to, to any asset class, no matter, you know, what you're thinking of. I think that's kind of the opinion across the board. The interesting thing about, you know, the digital asset space is really, um, you know, the, the first adopters, the first, you know, investors, the first traders, the first users were kind of more, in, you know, individual grassroots, right? It's kind of one of those asset classes that you know, um, was, you know, kind of came from um, that kind of movement, you know, total, totally separate um, than, than all the other traditional asset classes. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we had this, um, you know, huge run up in, you know, you know, call it price, call it, you know, action, call it interest. <laughs> and, um, you know, most of that was kind of retail fueled, whereas um, now you have, you know, more of the liquidity that comes into these markets, um, you know, it's, it's kind of institutional based. And so I, I'd say for, you know, a lot of people would think that's, that's probably a good thing. Um, okay. yeah. We're gonna open it up to questions in a little bit. So uh, be thinking of your questions, uh, but I do wanna talk about just being a small business or startup business. Uh, what motivates you? What gets you out of bed? What's your passion that gets you going, Dan? I think a big part of it is, you know, other than obviously I, I love this industry and I think it's super interesting. I think what gets me out of bed in the morning is I wanna make sure that the investors in our company, the, the folks who believed in us, have the opportunity to see it grow and see it flourish. And I, I think that that's like, that's a big motivator for me and I think it's a big motivator for everyone else on the team. Uh, I think that the other aspect of it potentially is it's just really, really cool to develop software and see it used by people and see people look at it and, 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 and you know, play around with it and say like, this, this is exactly what I'm looking for. You know, can I have this today? That's a, it's a good feeling. Can they test it now? Is it live? Uh, so uh, you, you can, we can provide specific access for potential clients to test the product. Uh, we will be uh, opening a, 
early access program for a number, small number of firms uh, to, to test out everything with the custodians as well. Uh, and that's gonna be uh, within the first couple quarters of this year. Um, we're nearing, you know, the a little bit past uh, first third of this quarter. So uh, it's something that we're anticipating is gonna really come up quickly here. Rock. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to, you know, bore a little bit with, you know, personal history, but I, I we'll give you a little bit. So right after, you know, I got out of school, like my first job was, uh, you know, work, worked for a startup, you know, was one, was one of the first, um, you know, this was Web 1.0, right? Um, beginning of the, of the 2000s. Um, um, caught a lot of traction, um, ran a Super Bowl ad, um, went public, and then everything crashed, we all left. Um, talk to and uh, you know a lot of people who are like, yeah, you're gonna go get a real job now. Like that whole internet thing, that's not gonna be a thing, right? Like no one's actually gonna, you know, like buy goods and services over the internet. That's all ridiculous. And to my, you know, not not that it, things went bad for me. You know, I, I you know went to the went to the exchange and started trading for a number of different firms and everything was cool. But I always had this feeling in the back of my mind, like when something as interesting as that hits again. I'm going to be the first one in the door, right? And so um, that's really what, like, you know, kind of keeps me going is that, um, you know, there's this product that's kind of in my space, but it's something that's, that's totally new. And I'm able to interface with a bunch of, you know, people that are just getting started as well. And not only that, people from all over the world. I mean, my, my first customer was, um, I mean, he's still you know, one of my bigger customers. He's uh, one of the largest um, market makers in Thailand in terms of on, on Thai exchanges and um, exchanges in Asia. And he wanted a place to kind of hedge his risk in you know regulated US markets. And I mean, never in a million years would I ever think that, not, you know, I thought my first you know uh, customer would just be some prop shop out of Chicago or whatever. But no, it's just a guy like trading in his garage in Thailand that has, you know, been, you know, like all these relationships all over the world. In fact, I'm, I'm meeting him um, early March. I'm going back to Chicago and he's meeting there and we're going to try to put together some other things. I mean, that's totally incredible. Like that's, that's, you know, we're in a space now that, um, you know, you could you bring in all these participants and that, you know, they, they, these guys and girls were not, you know, like your typical, you know, people participating in these, in these markets. These are brand new um, customers. It's not just jump trading or DRW, like flipping on a switch to make markets in, in you know, a different asset class, right? These are, you know, brand new participants and that's, that's really the most interesting thing to me. Cool. Questions? Let's open it up. Yes. Um, in your opinion, who are the bot leaders um, in blockchain from a business perspective? I mean, who do you like to follow, listen? Who do you think is saying interesting things? I'm going to uh, repeat the question. Who are the thought leaders that you're looking at? So I think there's there's the obvious uh, sort of the folks that are on TV, and I think it, it's important to acknowledge that they're kind of evangelizing it. I think it, you know, a good example would be like Anthony Pompliano, you know, evangelizing Bitcoin, and that sort of by proxy is evangelizing the space. So I think that's really important. Um, as much as I hate to say it, in some cases, uh, the more centralized uh, blockchain projects out there uh, often are the source of the most interesting thought leadership because they have the most use cases. Uh, and so you see these these companies. I mean, one of them uh, being Ripple. You know, they're they're very outspoken, and whatever you believe about the asset XRP. It doesn't matter, you know. They're they're really bringing this mainstream, and I think it's it's just super important to acknowledge that, and not not fight it. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity to go around, and uh, yeah, I, I just think it's you know it's important to to recognize that. Rock, what about you? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, thought leaders in the space, I kind of tend to gravitate towards people who are who are you know traders who are making markets. You know, uh, Max Budin, uh, B two C two. Um, you know, and, um, you know, f folks of that nature really, you know, um, I'm always like, um, you know, uh, kind of rejiggering my, my Twitter feed. You know, I get, I get really tired of like, you know, um, Ethereum maximalists or Bitcoin maximalists. Um, I'm really just interested, um, 
you know, and thought leaders that are that are doing something that people just aren't, you know, constantly regurgitating. So, um, I don't know. I can't. Th I can't think of like anybody else coming straight to mind right now. Any other questions? Yes. We've been talking uh, about. Oh, front, front, oh wait, wait, front, oh, front row, and then we'll get to you, Devin. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we've been talking about institutional investing in, di in the digital asset space really a lot for probably two or three years now as, as a price catalyst to get back to 20000 in, in Bitcoin. And there's been gradual adoption, but we haven't seen the wave that the market is expecting. Do you, do you see that in 2020, or, or is that still a way, ways away? So let me just repeat the question for the listeners. So uh, do you see a bullish market coming in, coming in, in the near future? Uh, personally speaking, I think there's a pretty high likelihood that there's gonna be, and there, there's a number of indicators uh, to support this as well, but a, a bull market appears to be approaching. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's necessarily going to originate entirely from institutional investment. And I can't sit here and tell you that 2020 is gonna be the year that this massive wave uh, takes over from an institutional perspective. But uh, I do think that 2020 will be a formative year in that it will lay the, the groundwork for a lot of, you know, potentially three, four more years after that where we will see a lot more of that wave. Uh, it's just, it's, takes more time than it feels like it should sometimes. And uh, I think right now it's about building the, the capability. You know, it's a, I think I may have mentioned uh, earlier to some folks here, but it's, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation, at least as far as the wealth management space goes, because the tools aren't there. So they're not investing in this asset class, but because they're not investing, there's not a whole lot of demand, so to speak, to build the tools, but really there's this sort of pent up, uh, obfuscated demand. And so I, I think it's just tapping into that. And that's that's the key to you know, seeing that wave develop. And Brock, what's your crystal ball? Well, I'm, I'm not um, actually allowed to make any type of price predictions in a public forum, but um, I, will say, I will say this. So, um, this is a like uh, digital assets in general is a tiny asset class when you look at it on a worldwide spectrum, right? 200, you know, let's call it, you know, Bitcoin, you know, 150, 200 billion, another 100 billion over that, all other digital assets. We're sitting in a town that has two companies that have higher than a trillion dollars of market cap, two companies, right? So two trillion dollars in one small town in the you know, corner of the United States, right? Like you know, digital ad, native digital assets is tiny. It doesn't take a lot of um, doesn't take a lot of creativity when you start you know lining up um, you know uh, hard money, soft money, you know uh, worldwide derivatives, everything else, hundreds of trillions and hundreds of trillions to kind of somehow seep into this asset class where like the lead asset has this you know investment thesis that you know. Um, is a is a digital store of value, a digital gold, right? Which you know, gold itself has a seven trillion dollar, you know, uh, market cap. So, um, I'm not going to say I'm bullish, but I'm you know, doesn't take a lot of creativity, right? Great, Devin, you had a question in the back. Uh, yes, uh, I had a question in regards to you made a statement with the original futures trading being rice, correct? And that was human psychology. What do you see the future market going towards institutional investing when we have things like tokenization, which is a full budget attack yep. on all asset classes because we can tokenize them. Yep. And then in the next four to seven years, we have factually $52 trillion being handed down to the younger generation while the old die. And right now, most institutions are reporting that over 90% of these people, the younger generation, are asking about Bitcoin. Right. With decentralization in its process, where do you see the institutional market going when people can now come into technology and say, I can be my own custodian and I can just use a software to trade for me or to manage it for me? Because I, the institutions were originally around because people had lack of knowledge and they didn't know how to perform these things. And then fast forward a couple hundred years, 200 years, we have regulations in place that protect them. But as decentralization continues to shake the core values of all assets, 
where are institutions going to be left when everybody can invest on their own? So I'll repeat the question because it's a simple answer. What, what's the impact of decentralization on institutional investing? Futurize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great question, and, and, and I'm glad you asked it. And, and I mean, you know, quite frankly, I see you're talking about the actual like institutional trading infrastructure, like an exchange like yes. CME, right, being so, disrupted by you know, decentralized finance yes. and that type of thing. So the offshore like Bitmax and Garibit, they're already working on smart contracts that can perpetuate and have a decentralized exchange. Right. Once we have decentralized exchanges, where do exchanges, the institutions go? Right. That one. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying too. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, obviously with a lot, you know, a lot of these technologies, you know, the, the underpinnings of them, it's, it's pretty easy for anybody to, you know, spin up a matching engine, you know, decentralized custody, um, that sort of thing, put together a whole infrastructure that would kind of like mimic what CME and ICE and New York Stock Exchange and everything else does. And that's absolutely going to happen. Right. Yeah. And I think basically, um, you know, where we'll get is, you have to you have to figure out um, you know kind of a, a, a legal manner right a, a, a legal uh, um, you know layer right um, you know chain governance things of those you know things of that nature will have to get a lot more sophisticated to where you know institutions will be able to interface with smart contracts um, to kind of protect themselves from operational risk of say trading on a decentralized exchange or dealing with you know self custody or different pockets of custodians. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, you, know, you know, coming from that world, I think it's absolutely going to happen. And I think that, um, I actually think that a lot of these, you know, institutions will have a large, you know, training institutions will have a large role to play in kind of how that shakes out. Yeah. But ultimately, like, you know, this, this whole ecosystem was, you know, um, came up to, you know, disrupt players like, you know, uh, you know, traditional RIAs and traditional exchanges in, yeah. That's absolutely going to happen. It's just, um, you know, I think it'll be more of a slow, arduous process, and like I'm totally excited to see kind of how it like plays out. I really like your answer. That's a very good answer. <laughs> yeah, Dan. I mean, I'll agree with most of what what Brock said, uh, but one caveat here from me is that, you know, here is a room full of people who are passionate about this subject and want to kind of own their financial destiny and. Uh, that's great, uh, but the majority of people don't want that responsibility for their own money. And so you'll see, a, it sounds silly, but it, it's true. And so you'll see, you know, the folks who want to participate in that way and you want to be your own custodian, you want to manage your own assets, there's going to be definitely, definitely be ways to do it. But uh, for the average Joe, they're going to look for someone in the space that's an authority that if if they you know misplace a key or if, if the money goes missing there's insurance and there's you know there's someone to blame there's some place to go you know that that's one of the uh you know big kind of pausing points for uh you know like I, i'm talking about my mom or or somebody else that i i meet on the street you know they like that safety net of having somebody else that's responsible for it. And I don't, I don't think that that's, that's going to go away until, you know, the system is essentially foolproof. Questions? Anybody else? Brent? Yeah, it's been uh, phenomenal to hear you guys talk and share your experience, by the way, so, so thank you for that. Um, uh, question, there, there seems to be more and more analysis about how uh, cryptocurrencies and investing is actually non-correlated to traditional assets. And holding several percentage points, you know, in your retirement portfolio, actually lowers the overall volatility and increases the, the alpha. I'd be curious to find out uh, what's that conversation like with not only the uh, RIAs that you're working with, but also the institutional investors who are investing on you know, behalf of big endowments and pension funds. I mean, what's the reaction, or even their customers' customers' reaction to that? So let me repeat that question. Uh, what's the risk tolerance, basically? Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh... I think there's definitely an awareness of it. Uh, we've never been through a recession where digital assets existed previously. So you can only go based on behavior that's potentially similar. And right now, uh, the best comparison is gold. Uh, so gold is non-correlated to uh, core markets and Bitcoin is even less correlated to core markets. 
So you put two and two together, it sort of looks like there's the potential uh, for it to be a, a good investment in that regard. Uh, typically we hear somewhere uh, between two and 5% as like a, a good allocation. You know, you're not going in too strong, but uh, you've got a piece of the action. And uh, I think that is, we're, we're kind of teetering on something. Not quite sure what it's gonna be, but you know, what goes up must come down. Can't continue like this forever. So it's a good idea to have that kind of diversity and financial advisors certainly know it. Back, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll, yeah, the only thing uh, I could add to that, I mean, you know, um, endowments, pensions funds, family offices, they don't really buy and sell, they just allocate, right? And they're all like the holy grail is, you know, um, risk parity things that, you know, are, are not correlated in the, in the effect on a portfolio. We look at you know correlations on a weekly basis, and any any time Bitcoin even comes in correlated to like any other major asset class, I'm like, yeah, darn it, like uncorrelate, you know, like. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, um, it's just you know, with with, with um, you know bodies of information like like Bitwise and Venex and all these folks that are trying to bring ETFs to market, releasing all of the all of their studies and information, like. It's always shocking to me to go and talk to IRAs or any other t kind of investor, and they like they haven't heard this whatsoever, you know. Um, and so it's it's yeah, it's certainly um, important and kind of puzzling at the same time. Okay. One more question. Yes. So I, I know there's kind of a contrarian streak in the blockchain space. Uh, I'm a big fan of Peter Thiel's work, and one of the questions he asks at the beginning of zero to one is. What is something you hold to be true that very few others agree with you on? So I would pose that to you kind of in the context of the blockchain space. So what is something you hold to be true that very few others in the blockchain space would agree with you on? So repeat the question, what are you contrary in your thinking on? Within the blockchain space? Yeah. I think uh, a lot of the very passionate individuals in this space that really gave rise to the prominence that Bitcoin and now a number of other assets uh, are seeing is that there's no compromise with them. It's either decentralization or bust. And I think that that is a great way for a fantastic technology to die very quickly. So I think that there's, a, there's gonna be a gradual process of having centralized uh, authorities in this space you, you have to have them in order it, you you can't fight the power that much you know it, it'll just be something that it gets put down but if you ease into it and you you do a little bit here you do a little bit there eventually we'll get there but i, I think you know don't let good or great get in the way of good I always get that one mixed up but i, I think that that's probably where i'm at Brock, any thoughts? Um, well, I mean, within the blockchain space, it's kind of hard. I guess I would just say one word, um, stable coins. Like I actually think stable coins are a much bigger deal than yeah. people are giving credit for. It's, it's one of those, you know, technologies that actually has, you know, real use case. There's a lot of people that think that, you know, Bitcoin is gonna be the killer of all fiat currency, that, you know, the dollar will be put on the back burner as the world's reserve currency. I actually think that we have, you know, a number of projects uh, in the United States and worldwide that are, um, you know, putting together pipes in order to, you know, even dollarize the world more, right? And, you know, what's kind of interesting, I don't even, I don't know if I should go out on this tangent, but so the, the, whole, the whole like theme behind um, like a stable coin, right? Like a digital dollar that's e easily transferable to, you know, any digital wallet that is backed by a reserve somewhere else is not exactly totally new and crazy. There's, you know, in the 1970s and 80s, um, um, there was, you know, kind of the creation of, of this thing called a Euro dollar. And a Euro dollar, I'm not talking about Euro currency, Euro dollar is slang for US dollars that are actually held in banks overseas, not under US jurisdiction, right? And the Soviets, since they were large in world trade, actually amassed a lot of US dollars that they couldn't use at all because there was, you know, all, you know, the, the two didn't talk. So they actually got a number of banks in Switzerland and in, in London to take their US dollar deposits. And now Euro dollars, actually, if you, if you look at futures and derivatives, the, the Euro dollar futures contract, which is an interest rate contract traded on CME, is the largest 
largest tradable instrument in the entire world. It has quadrillions in volume every single year. And I actually think that, you know, call it, you know, no matter what you think about Tether or TrueUSD or, or Stably or uh, th there's going to be humongous use cases for these. And it, I'm not guaranteeing it, but it might actually accelerate usage of dollars in the world if China doesn't kind of get, you know, in front of that, which, which they're trying to do, which is a whole other. Well, thank you very yeah. much. So, um, Brock and Dan, thank you for coming by. It was a fascinating conversation. I think we've been on for a long time. Uh, let's uh, give them a warm applause.